grace to you and peace from God, our Creator, and our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In my line of work, there's a lot of eating involved. I've discovered this over the years. It seems kind of like the lifeblood of the church to gather for food and fellowship. When I was younger, who I ate with was kind of a big deal. And I have a distinct feeling. I remember when we, when we moved to Davis in seventh grade, I knew like two people at Emerson Junior High School. I, I, I did a lot of uh, self-pity, a lot of feeling sorry for myself about this. Um, it, it, it worked out fine, but the, early on in my time there, I remember going into the lunchroom and thinking, who am I going to sit with? I don't really know anybody. And feeling very, very nervous about this. Is there, is there a place for me? Does a group want me to sit with them? Do I even have any friends? Uh, and I've, maybe you've experienced this before. You walk into a social situation. You're not really sure where you fit uh, or whether you're welcome, etc. It's a very nerve-wracking position to be in. We may have a sense that, uh, that there's like where the action is when you walk into like a party or, 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 or um, and maybe we feel like we're supposed to sit there. But one thing I've done lately, I've kind of noticed, is um, conscientiously sat at the empty table and not the table where all the action is and where the people are. And what I've been surprised by is that people will come sometimes and sit with me that I'm delighted to spend time with and to talk Amen. to me and so forth that I wouldn't have chosen just from looking around the room. And so it, it, it is a, it's sort of a fascinating experiment and uh, interesting thing to try. The basic question, do I belong here? Is there a place for me? And particularly tied to table fellowship is not new. It's actually very ancient. In our gospel, for example, Jesus gives us a simple lesson on table manners to the group of Pharisees that he's invited to eat with. Now it's important to note that although the New Testament often portrays the Pharisees as Jesus' enemies, as bad people, or sometimes we equate Pharisee with hypocrisy, really Jesus was very likely a Pharisee himself, or someone that was trained like a Pharisee. He debated scripture and talked like a rabbi, talked the lingo, and as we all know, we often disagree with those people that are most similar to us. So well, that's a common uh, interpretation of why Jesus is constantly arguing with Pharisees. Well, in this case, he's invited to a meal, a Sabbath meal particular, in particular, at, um, at their house. And it says in verse 1, as I read, that they were watching him very closely. But notice, he was also watching them. And he must have seen a very fascinating scene unfolding before his eyes. These dinner guests were all kind of like jockeying for the best place at the table. And that was important in that uh, culture. It was an honor culture, and who you ate with made a big difference. Uh, the dinner host at the dinner party was kind of like the center of attention. And the people that the host invited to sit in the place of honor were the folks that were honored. Well, certain people were just kind of claiming the place of honor, apparently, at this dinner Jesus is at. And maybe embarrassing themselves. Um, as we read in Proverbs this morning, it's only in being, being invited by the host to the place of honor that we are blessed, not when we claim it for ourselves. You will be royally embarrassed, he says, if you sit at the wrong seat and then are demoted. And even the way he imagined the host responding to the person uh, who sits in the place of honor that doesn't belong there. Give your seat to this person, is the way the text reads. Versus sitting down at the, not at the place of honor, and being invited up to the place of honor. Friend, come and sit in the place of honor. It is a choice between honor and shame, which was a really big deal uh, in the time of Jesus and his culture. Honor, again, he says, is not gained by seizing it, but by being, being invited into it. And our society, I have to say, sadly, does not always value this kind of character that puts the other before the self. Rather, we reward those who assert themselves and may step on others to get ahead. Jesus' message is simple, as relevant today, perhaps, as it was then. Humble yourself and you will be exalted. 
in the right way. Now, there's a problem with this, and every time I've read this, I've thought about this. Now, one way of interpreting what Jesus says is that this is another tactic for getting ahead. So the real way to get ahead is to pretend that, you, that you're humble, and then you'll be invited into a place of power. That may have been what the writer of Proverbs is trying to say, which is a book about maxims and so forth. Wisdom for living in the world. In that case, that's just another, perhaps more shrewd tactic for getting ahead. However, clearly, humility is a virtue in itself for Jesus. At least according to the evangelist Luke, who regularly declares the blessedness of poverty and lowliness. Blessed are you poor, Jesus says in Luke's gospel, as opposed to the more familiar, blessed are the poor in spirit, from Matthew's gospel. And we know the great Magnificat by Mary at the beginning, when she finds out she's going to bear the baby Jesus, she says, God is the one who casts the mighty down from their thrones and lifts up the lowly of heart. Humility itself is a virtue. For this reason, perhaps, Jesus turns to the host. And here's an interesting little twist on this whole uh, a gospel reading. And makes the point that humility isn't just for the guests, but for the hosts as well. Show humility in your invitations, he says. Don't just invite people who will reward you by inviting you to their dinner parties. But invite those who can't repay. Those who are poor and destitute. Those who really need your food and your fellowship. In this, you will also find blessed. And I'm especially aware of this text and texts like these when those that are poor or in special need come to me and ask for money as, as a pastor or homeless people on the street. In some cases, I'm quite sure they are manipulating my charity or trying to, to use me to get something. But I can't help but think these are people with great need. And these are very likely the same kind of people Jesus probably had in mind when he said these words. In any case, these, these words of Jesus are for God's table manners. And by table manners, I don't just mean being polite, saying please and thank you, and you know, uh, passing using your napkin and so forth. Those are important, don't get me wrong. We need to do those things. But the table can be a metaphor in the New Testament for God's kingdom, the place where God's will is effective, for heaven. Those who assert themselves in this world will be humbled, but those who humble themselves will be exalted, Jesus said. This is a, a phrase that has to do with the heavenly banquet. And it's the great reversal that Jesus always preaches. Those who are first, as Susan told us, are the least, the lost, and the last. Those at the back of the line. Those are the ones that God cares about. Those are the ones that God notices. We are always invited, although we are never quite worthy. A truth we must never lose sight of. The life of Christian discipleship, of following Jesus on the way of the cross, is a life of accepting this grace, this gift of God. And what it says about us as people that we're not worthy, we don't earn it ourselves, and we're not on our own. Accepting this grace and reflecting it to others, extending it especially to those who are most in need of it. We see the world, as a mentor of mine once said, through cross-colored Glasses. With the loving eyes of our Father in heaven, who sees us with grace Thank and love. Amen. The blessing of which Jesus speaks is not so much that we get something for being humble, that it's some kind of tactic for getting ahead in the world, or for earning our own salvation. Rather, the blessing is in humility itself. We give ourselves away to the other as Jesus does for us. And it's in this kind of relationship, this giving and taking, that we know God. This is a life of blessing.
us. Well, what does this grace and this ethics, this way of living in the world that flows from it mean in our world today? Who are we invited to be with and not? Do we have a place or be accepted? And who do we invite to eat? And what does that mean? And that may be a more interesting question to think of ourselves as the host. Who are we inviting over? Who are in our lives, either literally or metaphorically? Amen. Do we welcome those who truly need bread and truly need fellowship? Or do we invite others only because they will invite us in return? Sometimes taking an unfamiliar path, choosing an empty table, or looking not to where the action is in a social setting, but to where it isn't. Looking to the margins, as God always does, can be a surprise blessing. Perhaps that is what Jesus invites us into today. Now, it may seem an impossible task in our work or our home or our school lives to show this kind of humility. We may feel compelled. We have to assert ourselves to get ahead. Or else, take charge, be bold, our culture tells us. Even if in doing so, we end up humiliating ourselves. Nothing ventured, as they say, nothing gained. However, God comes into our life and shows us another reality, that the impossible actually is possible. The inconceivable is imaginable. It is what Jesus called the kingdom or the reign of God. And it is imaginable because we have seen it. 